people like games. What's up, everybody, and welcome back. It's been a while, but I'm returning with a very, very cool guest, Rick the Hadoo Tire, whose name pronunciation I made sure to look up, the general manager of Evo. Thank you for joining us. I am happy to be here. I'm going to start us off on the fun thing of the Hado and last name is Thire. Oh, there we go. And so I was like halfway there, but we tried. But regardless, you thank you for coming through. Thank you for joining oh, and gosh, uh, taking yeah. the time. I know this is probably your first sort of conversation post Evo. So congratulations on what was the statistically biggest event that you guys have ever thrown over there. Um, out of us had 9,000 players and 80% increase, increase from 2022. And uh, so that's huge. How do you feel? Are you alive now? It's been a couple of weeks. Uh, definitely alive, feeling pretty good about the show. It's it's always interesting going into a show, hoping it can reach scale aspirations. Mm -hmm. And finding it even more interesting coming out the backside of a show that exceeded scale aspirations. There's always the idea of, can we throw the biggest of anything? Absolutely. And now we have. So it's where do we go from there? Absolutely. See, that that's funny because I actually was just listening to one of your conversations with the land parties and the last question I heard is, what are you hoping to get out of the event? So your first reaction being, hey, we exceeded expectations versus your I like to wait and see uh, mindset is it feel it feels better than having underwhelmed, I imagine. Right. Oh, absolutely. The the coolest thing about exceeding expectations or even not meeting expectations, truthfully, is they just offer different types of insights by having huge chunks of the show go well gives you an increased focus on issues that came up because instead of it not meeting certain aspirational goals, it provides an opportunity to go, well, you know, that placard didn't print right Absolutely. or line security didn't work out as desired. And now it's a different set of focus points for going into next year's show in regards to what to refine and what to improve. Absolutely. So actually, I'm just going to skip some of my intro questions and sort of build off this because one of my first questions was you came on to the general manager position in 2021. Uh, I know 2022 was probably the first year back after COVID. And so arguably this past iteration was the first one that you've been able to do without any of the COVID protocol requirements, right? Yes. Yeah. So how did that feel in terms of planning and sort of preparing? Because you would come into like a modified version and then now you're sort of had like everything opened up. How did that feel? What lessons were you able to take from one to the other? Or was it a, a different experience? So I think on my end coming into the show versus this show, it didn't COVID itself didn't change how we prepped for the show because we were trying to figure out how do we refine the tournament experience, make that better for the player base. How do we engage the community side of the event experience, produce a convention that really lands culturally, hits on all aspects of fighting games. It opened up some opportunities for additional guests to come, like the Capcom Jams Band segment probably would not have happened in 2022 because fewer people were traveling into the show overseas. Mm -hmm. But in terms of did it change the approach to the show, not really. In both years, the show is about cultivating an experience where people can come together and compete in fighting games and appreciate fighting games. COVID didn't change that. I think it changed the amount of people that came. Hmm. Okay. So it's, well, that's okay. I see what you're saying. So it's just a few more on the logistics byline instead of necessarily fundamentally changing the approach. Um, and so then now, yeah, you've sort of gone through a major one. You are sort of coming from a background of building something from the ground up. And the reason I mention that is you're the founder of Combo Breaker, which is one of the largest tournament organizers for fighting games uh, in the Midwest and now arguably the world that you sort of scale out. But point being, you mentioned Evo as a con, like more of a regular convention now. Is that something you sort of brought from your prior experience that, hey, it's not just a fighting game tournament, because I think that's what Evo sort of synonymous with. It sort of is now expanding outward. Is that from your prior experience or? It's it's a bit of prior experience, but it's also, I think, a philosophy approach. Mm -hmm. When I look at an event like Combo Breaker versus my local tournament at the moment at the Mall of America with Wisdom Gaming, mm -hmm. if I look at Combo Breaker and then contrast it with Evo, at its core, each of these events is a fighting game competition. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. each of these events has something to do around the competition to help generate the attendance that's arriving, whether it's just hanging out with like-minded people, whether it's food opportunities to go and kind of have conversations about the matches that you've just played, so on and so forth. Evo always had a little bit more of that. Combo Breaker had some of that local event might not have much of it at all in regards to the convention side activities. Mm -hmm. But the only thing I think that changes from show to show is how much of it can get activated. And so think of it, think of it like a concert. Mm -hmm. If you go see Metallica at an arena versus Metallica in a club versus Metallica at, I don't know, a high school talent show, all three experiences, you're getting Metallica playing music. That aspect fundamentally shouldn't change much, except for maybe the comfort level of changing the set list. But the experiential components around that, the scale of the stage, the pyro, the light show, the additives of that experience drastically scale up. Mm -hmm. And so for Evo, I think we're reaching the top of that scale point. It's a show where if you go and there's going to be somebody at a table in the artist alley it's not one it's a hundred yeah if you go and there's an opportunity to see a developer or a publisher activate a on-site experience it's probably not one it's all of them mm -hmm. so that scale differential is what separates the shows to me mm -hmm. but it's also what gives each of those shows their own value do you find a little complexity in that's like that using that same example like you're not going to see metallica at an individual concert now you're seeing metallica at a festival and does yes. that change the sort of logistics oriented where you're like okay for this day we're most open or most focused on things outside of the tournament or do you have to have sort of an equal focus on each aspects i think the tournament always has to stay in focus mm -hmm. evo is rooted in being a tournament it's a tournament first and foremost when you look at the attendance space a, a very sizable portion of who's on site is there to compete or at least engage with that competition. Mm -hmm. um, I think the festival example is perfect because festivals have to share resources often against bands of drastically different fan bases, drastically different scales. Some of the best festivals have multiple stages to kind of mm -hmm. deal with that. Evo has that. There's going to be multiple games. Many of them have thousands upon thousands of players in the bracket. Many of them have tens of thousands of fans on site at the show. So how you engage them holistically is important. Whereas at a smaller show, that's not always necessary. Do you have more of a specific demographic? So now I know fighting games in particular probably have an extremely varied age demographic where you can go as young as like, you know, eight, nine years old kids could love it versus 50, 60 years old, then all people will want to go. So when you're sort of planning, is there a specific subsect of that demographic that you're like, okay, we can focus on this and then sort of appeal to the additional people around them? Like who's the middle of the Venn diagram? So I think the interesting thing for Evo to me is if you look at the attendance base, the two groups that are the most likely to be present are fandom that's just been created. People have just gotten into fighting games, discovered Evo because it's the largest brand and are getting that first experience. Like when we were at finals this year and asked how many people it was their first time being here, over half the arena raised their hands. It was an oh, wow. incredible visual. But the other half is renewed fandom or generational fandom. People who maybe aren't diving into competitive fighting games every single day, but know that language, know some of that history and need a place to surface that once, twice a year. And so hitting on both people who have been around for 30 some years now, dating back to Street Fighter II, and people who showed up three months ago with mm -hmm. Street Fighter VI, yes, there's a huge swash in between those two sides of the diagram, but I think if you can cover experiences that appeal to both of those extremes, mm -hmm. You're going to hit everybody in the middle because then you're generating a show that is dedicated to either new or returning fandom, which means the show as a whole is really about perpetuating fandom. And if you can embrace that, I think you can serve anybody that's attending. A hundred percent. I think that's super interesting because actually one of the questions I had here was how FGC sort of avoided the sports franchising model craze that sort of went through. But then as you're mentioning it, 
I think what they were trying to do was build a league that would have that sort of legacy importance away. Like you said, you have someone from Street Fighter 2. They have a kid. That kid's now growing up. They're bringing them into the fold. So you're sort of more of an, a unique space. Do you think of FGC comparative to other esports like a CSGO or do you find it occupies its own unique niche? So the overlying phrase is the same, but you can't call FGC and not the same. I think fighting games have been a, a decentralized ecosystem so long that it became aggressive about relying on that decentralized ecosystem. Hmm. Even when a publisher comes in and hosts the Capcom Pro Tour, which this year is actually probably the most isolated it's been. There's only a few offline events on the circuit. Everything else is an online tournament. Now the netcode supports it. When that circuit was initially developing, it was going to a bunch of community events, partnering with organizers of a bunch of different scales and showcasing a reason to gather and rally around the brand. Mm -hmm. That has been an approach time and time again in fighting games that I think has left our ecosystem not necessarily incapable of being caught up in the same waves of attention or waves of spending and ideas that occur throughout esports in general, but has made it a bit harder for the entirety of the fandom to get swept up by it. Hmm. Because there is a sense of almost co-ownership amongst the fan base and the publishers of what the competitive ecosystem is it's been designed collaboratively it has been celebrated collaboratively and i think if it continues to maintain that approach it will be an ecosystem that has a that's the right way to say this an ecosystem that has a sense of permanence that i don't think is always found through just creating something new and putting it out into the market because there will always be a sense of that relationship between the game and the fan base being earned. Yeah. Well, see, that's funny because now that actually brings to mind like the question of the games, right? So then Evo almost falls, maybe sort of stuck within the cyclical cycle of who has or what is a popular title, right? So you can't know ahead of time. So say, you know, Street Fighter Six came out maybe a month or two before Evo and that sort of pushed like the largest ever, you know, sign up for that game in particular. If you didn't have that game coming out sort of in tune or time, do you find that that would affect the overall registration percentage? So like now this is a big year for fighting games. You'll have Project L, you'll have Mortal Kombat 1, you'll have Tekken 8. All of that will set the stage for the games you can do there. But then how do you account for your like, okay, we have this huge group that just came in through multiverses in 2022. And then like literally they were a main event for your, for, for EVO last year. And now the game doesn't even exist right can think, you even plan for that or like is there a specific games that you're like all right this is our communities even if there's a decentralized we'll go in there and sort of as someone from that decentralized community you know how to bring that group together and into a larger fold so i think evo like most things within fighting games is always going to benefit from the attention and the promotion cycles that comes with new releases that's symbiotic mm -hmm. i think one of the things that is different is the event isn't necessarily beholden to a new release title. Hmm. There is an ability for us to look at the ecosystem and go, anybody that gets into fighting games pretty much has to learn a language to play fighting games and stay engaged with fighting games on a community level. And for the most part, people look for ways to exercise that language. That's why the release of Guilty Gear Strive actually increased the number of players playing Guilty Gear Extrude Rev 2. And that increase also goes down the line and increases the number of players playing Guilty Gear Accent Core Plus R. That shared understanding creates a positioning where so long as we are hosting fighting games and there are people who want to engage with fighting games, I think the show will always be stable. Will it have higher years or lower years based on incoming games or outgoing games? Sure. But... I think there's a generational fandom quality mm -hmm. that exists beyond just the title that frequently, I shouldn't say frequently, the title that just came out and the title that came out decades ago. That's why we uh, we tried a throwback tournament at Evo in Las Vegas this year with Ultimate Marvel vs. Capcom 3, and that's still a thousand plus competitors. We tried the Virtua Fighter 5 tournament in Evo Japan last year because that game's still extremely popular in that region. Mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. 800 plus people registered for that more so than many newer titles that were being hosted at the show. Thanks. So I think as long as we stay cognizant of what people want to play, what the fandom is playing and what is being rallied for year to year, we will regularly find ourselves in a position where we're running the newest titles because that's the freshest conversation. Yeah. But I think long term, we're not beholden to just the new release in the same way that you might have listened to the new Nas record in the last week, but you're mm-hmm. probably still going to wind up listening to Illmatic 2. And mm-hmm. yes, reaching for the New York examples, given the hat you're wearing, but we are New Yorker, dear. Actually, I know you're a Midwest guy, but I'm my <laughs> finest flannel too. Yeah, there you go. Uh, but I think that that's part of the strength of fighting games. A lot of the times with a lot of genres, when you release a new title, everything down the line just kind of disintegrates. Mm-hmm. But the ability to hold on to what has come before to inform what we're enjoying now is where I think the equity of the genre actually comes from. Do you see that legacy thing being a burden and a boon in the sense that maybe you always need a new Mortal Kombat title, but maybe there won't be the chance because of that for a new Mortal Kombat to come to exist for the next generation? So it's not, you know, dependent upon it, but it is that fandom ship's like, oh, we don't get tech in this year. I don't want to be part of it. And so you're just like, I mean, come on, it's just fighting games. So do you find it's more a commitment to, obviously this is a very varied question, but to fighting games or to the specific lineages of the fighting games they like? I think it's a commitment to fighting games. I think being able to speak to or showcase connectivity for the various lineages matters in the same way that being able to speak dialects of a language matters. If you really want to have the deepest conversation possible, usually you need to be able to speak exactly as someone speaking to you. Do I think that that makes us beholden to any given game? No. Do I think that that increases the likelihood that a specific franchise should be at the show? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Am I interested in seeing how that develops over the next 10 or 20 years? Very much so. Particularly as we get into a market where new publishers and new IP are incoming. Yeah. yeah that's what actually, as you know, Project L comes in, it's one of the few new, t- you know, developers that are bringing in sort of a new energy i know injustice a few years back so there's always a game that arrives and then it's sort of like what happened before but not even sort of being beholden i don't know if you're allowed to answer this feel free to say pass if you're not but you know upon the purchase of evo by playstation rts nintendo sort of pulls out right so when you have to deal with the version of that is it all right that would have been nice now we just have to move on or is it a way that you're still trying to like hey guys you should come back for the future because i know i don't know how exclusivity works so much so with these games it'd be like oh they're not allowed to do street fighter tournament and you're like it's not anyone could do a street fighter tournament you know so is that is that something you think about or is that something you cannot comment on the market's always complex how entities collaborate or don't in the market is even more complex I'm still incredibly interested. We're still incredibly interested in hosting Nintendo's titles. We announced that now a couple of years ago. That remains unchanged. Evo wants to be a brand and more importantly, wants to be an event where we can rally as much of this genre's fan base together in one space. Mm -hmm. Super Smash Brothers is still one of the largest brands in fighting games. It would be great to have them included. Nintendo, you heard the man. We'd love to see you at Evo, which actually does remind me, you mentioned Evo Japan. Do you guys do multiple or is that Evo Japan the second or the other one that you guys do? I thought there was only Evo in Vegas. At the moment, there's both Evo in Las Vegas and then there's Evo Japan in Tokyo. What what are the dates on that one? So and that, dates for Evo Japan next year are the closing week of April and I'm going to make sure that I don't get that wrong and pull up a document because I'm coming off of jet lag and my brain's not quite working the way I want it to. But April 27th to 29th in 2024. And then we just updated our save the date for Las Vegas and it'll be July 19th to 21st in 2024. You are the man. I got to make sure to come out. I've not been to an Evo before, so I got to make sure to try to get out to this year's. But now you've sort of moved in you've been part of the esports space fgc space but now probably 
from 2016 to now, it sort of changed in its sort of function. So the amount of VC money that started coming in with the beginning of the Overwatch League, did that affect event organizing for FGC in any way? Or was that sort of like its own bubble sort of off in the corner? Because like you, you have sponsors, you had a couple of new non-endemic yeah. ones. Do you have to convince them that, hey, we're we're not we're not doing that version or is it like people can have differentiate? I can't speak a lot to venture capital spending as it hasn't been a big part of my experience in the events that I've worked on. Mm. I don't think that the types of proposals that we put out for our shows for activations and marketing potential have dramatically changed. We're still offering the attendance figures that we've been offering, the viewership figures that we've been offering, the stability of recurring annual, annual events that we've been offering. Am I sure that the market is changed in the wake of that? Probably. Has it impacted what I'm working on personally? Not much yet. Not much. That's interesting. I would have, uh, I sort of assumed because like they, it feels like the FGC one, I was actually going to ask, how come there's so much more of because you mentioned Nas, there's such more of a hip hop influence in the FGC compared to everywhere else or in other esports. Do you think that's because it has such a sort of diversity of gamers comparative to, you know, some of the other titles, which are more regionally specific? I think it's probably the diversity component. I think a bunch of it is fighting games come from arcade culture. You had to rally together to compete. You had to be in places that could afford to have an arcade so that there was a population density that supported that. You weren't playing online much in the development of what the competitive ecosystem was. You can now, which is phenomenal, but for years you really couldn't. Yeah. So thinking about the fact that hip hop roots in more population dense areas than not, I think that's probably a related outcome it would make more sense which actually does bring to mind then now sort of the density and sort of the the more again it's, it's grassroots because you're someone who started an org that does now what you do at scale starting for with that sort of experience do you now from this space wonder do, do you see a disconnect in other people or in other organizations that have not had people like you that sort of you have to start it. You know what it feels like to get the people, to market the people, organize the people, not theoretically, but like you started at 10 people and now you're at X, you know, thousand. Is that in form or is it sort of like a lot of the stuff you learned early on, maybe not as applicable at scale? I think some of it's informed. I think some of it's not applicable at scale at all. I think a big part of it is what you're building towards and for. For fighting games, a lot of the time, all of the events got built just to try to get either your friends or your region and at scale, your nation or international competition together in one place to compete. There really was no secondary goal. Even the sales goals that have developed at most fighting game events at this point are just there to sustain the show. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of production vehicles that have additional KPIs or different KPIs beyond that. Mm -hmm. And that's probably the most dramatic split I've seen in working with exclusively fighting game organizers versus other parts of the industry. Interesting. Interesting. Which actually now I know you got to get out of here a few. So we're going to move on to a couple of our final questions, but move as you're mentioning um, now with, how do you see basically the maturation of the FGC space moving towards now from a scale um, of development of the community, you sort of have the Eagle's eye view before you were from the ground up. So now, you know, what do you see this place looking like? Cause obviously esports and the other spaces thought they'd be a franchise model here, here, and that sort of stopped, right? E FGC never changed from that decentralized grassroots sort of regional movement other than these sort of main events. So I guess for you now, is it sort of just going to stay like that? What do you see it as? I think the sandbox is just getting bigger. And, and I know there's a perspective of franchise model versus not franchise model, but Street Fighter League engaged with components of franchise models, both stateside and in Japan for that product. So it's not that it's something completely foreign to the environment that we're in. Mm -hmm. What I think has changed in recent years and what's really informing the years to come, though, is the scale of connectivity 
both of players and fans, but also developers and publishers to their fans. And we're seeing that experimentation now in the Street Fighter VI Battle Hub. We're seeing that in Tekken 8 is coming out and incorporating more dramatic features in both the battle mechanics and then in some of the flair for the spectators that are watching. You're seeing new experiments with how tour structures are supposed to work coming out of our system works now after having not done that type of stuff in the past. You're seeing versions of Red Bull Kumite that host multiple games instead of being centralized on just one franchise. There is, I think for me, an outlook of infinite potential sounds too broad, but an almost never ending sense of where the horizon is. Mm -hmm. And everybody's out sailing towards it now. And over the years, it has felt like everyone is sailing in different directions, trying to figure out what might work, what could work. In the last couple of years, I think we're starting to get into an environment where a lot of people are sailing in the same direction mm -hmm. and are actually talking to each other and starting to figure out how to either share resources or collaborate on knowledge earned over the last decade of the experiments that got us to now. Mm -hmm. That's where I think fighting games are going, not necessarily into a specific model, into a wealth of shared understanding that's going to, for the first time, probably be productized and turned into something that's stable for the fan base to rally towards, for the player base to find stability within. I don't know when it's going to arrive, but my faith in it showing up has never been higher. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, as, as, as your attendance numbers show, I mean, I don't think that faith is misplaced. I think, you know, as you guys scale up, as the amount of gamers increases, as that generational flow increases, I'm sure, as you said, it's infinite, and I do totally agree and understand what you mean by sailing in the same direction after a whole lot of experimental years. Um, and so that, I guess, will bring us now to more or less the final question. I think we sort of touched on everything with uh, with regards to organization um, that I had in mind. I guess the other question would be, what do you see the future of EVO as? But it'll probably be just a better version of what we just did. I definitely hope it's a better version of what we just did. Yeah. Uh, I think the future of Evo is being a cultural cornerstone, being something that can be relied on to touch on where the community's at, where the community's been, where the community's going, and hopefully can do it in more ways than it's doing now. Because I think there is an opportunity for Evo, particularly with the funnel it has. People tune in and watch Evo that don't engage in fighting games outside of Evo weekend for the most part. Yes. To help people find where in the giant sea of fandom that fighting games have come to represent is their ship. Mm -hmm. Is it in the really, really invested tournament players? Is it in the tech monsters and the lab monsters sitting at home figuring out how to break a system mechanic? Is it with the cosplayers? Is it with the artisans? Is it with the musicians? Is it with people that really want to figure out how to speed run getting good at 15 different games at a time? There are aspects to what it means to being a community member that require having enough information about the community to find out where you belong. I think Evo has not just an opportunity, but potentially even a responsibility of helping people have enough information to find their part. Absolutely. And, and I, you know, I think you guys do a great job because I feel like since, you know, a lot of the interviews I even saw with you, it just really focus on engaging um with a lot more people outside of just the ones who are competing and like you said that falls into someone like me who might not be there for an actual playing for a game or something but you're there for an experience you love games you love you know whatever it is and if you have a bit more like like i mentioned early on the convention experience i think that just helps to bring the wall down to someone who's like oh i don't get competitive gaming and not realizing it's just a community um and so great work over there with that and uh, we're going to bring you to our final question that we ask every guest that comes on here. What is one book, story, manga, comic, any form of fiction that you would love to see made into a video game? Oof. I know. I People, I love to drop that at the end and everyone's like, you could have just brought that up earlier. I'm like... So does it have spot. to be something 
Does it have to be yeah. something that hasn't been made into a video game previously or something that hasn't been made into a video game that I think satisfies the source material? It can be both. One person said they wanted a uh, <laughs> one person wanted a civil service uh, simulator and another person wanted an Eddie ed, ed video game. It's a it's a it's a wide open place. So which which one is it that exists and what would it be that doesn't exist? I'll give you both options. All right, I'll cheat and I'll give you both. I would like a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles game that satisfies the entirety of that lore, because mm. thus far, pretty much it's side scroll beat em ups. Yes, I was going to say. And I would like FromSoft to make a Berserk game. Very interesting. That is a, that is a perfect answer. Actually, I had one person say Berserk as well. But funny enough, no one said from soft because now I just picture that in my head and now I see where you're going with it. And so anyone I mean, from, from from Dark Soft, soft is there? already I mean, Dark Souls is already 50 percent there. I was going to say I was like, they, but like, just put the modders. You heard the man just get, just get it in there. They take care of everything. But all right, that would be it. Thank you, Rick, for uh, coming on the show, answering these questions. I appreciate it. As someone who's done a couple of events myself, it was great to hear just about the logistics of it and the planning and so uh hope that one day in the future like uh circle back around have you on again chat again happy to do so happy to be here i have to ask before i leave because the camera quality doesn't quite let me know is that kelvin and hobbs behind you that is kelvin and hobbs that is a uh, that is the top edition of uh of all of the full collection bill waterson and so if you folks have not read it before let's go pick it up it's a it's a piece of art Worth every penny. Worth every penny.